stronger Now you're no longer Using up this space of mine So um, a little while ago I made a quick look for the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe now, quick looks are usually casual, unscripted affairs with more than one commentator where they mill about in a new game to check it out, but this quick look was in a different format than usual for a few reasons. So I only answered very basic questions to kind of keep that going, but I did foreshadow that I would make another video answering less basic, more interesting questions, and this is it. Hi! Besides stuff like how much is it and when does it come out, here's a better question. Are you sure you want more Stanley Parable? Why? I think that's just one of the questions that the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe is asking you. Most of the new content is a commentary on the reception of the previous game, the demands for a sequel, and how trying to meet player expectations is kind of impossible because expectations are all over the place. The jump circle? And then it proceeds to basically be a sequel to the Stanley Parable anyway. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Because what is a sequel? What is content? What even is new enough when you play a DLC or a sequel to a game? It feels like the lines have become increasingly blurred over the years as remakes, remasters, reimaginings, sequels, and DLC have overtaken the gaming market even more than they were in 2013, when the first Stan Para came out. Anyway, gamers, or at least the louder ones, tend to want the familiar and nostalgic. They balk at things that depart too harshly from what's already been established. And yet, they want innovation. They don't want to play the same thing twice. You can see this behavior in almost any hobby, of course, but this is a video game website, so... I'm gonna talk about video games. I had a whole section about Silent Hill games here, but it's gone now. To sum it up, though, Silent Hill sequels have historically addressed a lot of fan complaints about the previous game in the series, only for the sequel to come out and for fans to declare that this sucks and the series is dead. Again! Yay! For example, some folks didn't like that Silent Hill 2 wasn't a story sequel to Silent Hill 1. That was kind of jarring. They expected it to keep going. You've seen her many times, restored to her former self. What? So Silent Hill 3 was a continuation of Silent Hill 1's story. Then the complaint was that it was too much cult junk and that Silent Hill 2 was better, and we have not gotten over that ever since, because all the Western games tried very hard to be Silent Hill 2. Oof. My point is, and it's a major theme of Ultra Deluxe, you can't please everyone. We humans have an amazing ability to nitpick and balk at new, unfamiliar things, and meanwhile nostalgically idolize old things, and the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe revels in mocking that. And I count myself in that statement about nostalgically idolizing old things. I'm the jerk with a show about my gaming opinions, and one of them is that the 90s Mario Brothers movie should be canon, and I'm not joking. But I appreciate the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe making me confront that aspect of myself as not just a consumer. Oh my god, I really am insufferable with this Silent Hill shit, aren't I? But also as a creator myself, you can't please everybody ever. And in trying to do so, you're probably just going to dilute your vision, stress yourself out, and still manage to disappoint people anyway. You can read the comments, but if you actually let them get to you, you're kind of being a dummy. That's how I interpret Act 2 of the new content, at least. The game's writer, Davey Reedon, has a way about not giving the player quite what they think they want, and almost kind of tricking them into liking it. And I don't even know how intentional that is. It's the gaming equivalent of, here comes the airplane, and then swapping out that yummy food for broccoli. And like, you didn't want broccoli, but it's nutritious, and you're a stupid baby, and I tricked you! You know how reverse psychology works on a little kid? The Stanley Parable is all that stuff. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left.
This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. You wouldn't have hung out in that broom closet as long as you did if it wasn't suggested by the narrator that you really shouldn't. Right? Maybe to you this is somehow its own branching path. Maybe when you go talk about this with your friend, you'll say, Oh, did you get the broom closet ending? The broom closet ending was my favorite. You were testing him to see what would happen. It's like how little kids misbehave to see a reaction. There's someone you've been neglecting, Stanley. Someone you forgot. What? Really? I was in the middle of something. Do you have zero consideration for others? Whereas the OG Stanley parable is a meta commentary on gaming tropes, the illusion of choice, and the sometimes sick, often unfun compulsion of gamers to push boundaries and explore every nook and cranny of a game if there's even the smallest chance they'll be rewarded for it. At first, Stanley assumed he'd broken the map, until he heard this narration and realized it was part of the game's design all along. He then praised the game for its insightful and witty commentary into the nature of video game structure and its examination of structural narrative tropes. The Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe is, well, certainly more of that, but with an extra hint of the beginner's guide's more confrontational, sometimes hard to swallow introspection. Which, if you haven't played the beginner's guide, you should, because firstly, I'm about to spoil it, and secondly, I want you to eat your vegetables. And I wonder if you disliked the beginner's guide for being too navel-gazy or pretentious or what have you, how did you feel about the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe? Was that fine? Did it rub you the wrong way too? Did Davey successfully do the airplane maneuver on you, or is there something different going on here? I mean, leave a comment. I'm honestly curious. And um, please don't be mad that I implied that you're a baby, because that would be a big baby thing to comment about. Are you a baby? But let's talk about The Beginner's Guide, Davey Reardon's other game, which came out after the original Stanley Parable because another series of questions Ultra Deluxe is raising, in my opinion, has to do with pretentious, introspective stuff. First and foremost, I gotta say that it's really hard to discuss and interpret the beginner's guide without falling directly into the bad behaviors that its main character, Davey, exemplifies. Because now he wants something to hold on to. He wants a reference point. He wants the work to be leading to something. And secondly, and second mostly, uh, yeah, Davey Reedon is playing a fictionalized version of himself in this game, so this might get a little confusing. So I'm going to be calling the fictional Davey in the game just Davey, and the writer of the game by his last name, Reedon. Okay? Okay. Let's sum it up. The Beginner's Guide is presented as though it's based on reality. It includes dates, Reedon's real name, voice, and accolades, and seemingly his email address. So thanks for joining me on this. If you have a particular interpretation that I haven't mentioned here, or if you just need to get in touch, you can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. It's a disconcertingly personal account of the parasocial relationship Davey has with Coda, a friend of his who inspired him to make games such as The Stanley Parable. And Davey is showing off Coda's games in the hopes that the appreciation and praise it garners will inspire Coda to return to game development. Coda's games are incredibly simplistic. They're more along the lines of game jam experiments than more traditional games. Davey follows along the player, narrating his interpretations of not only the games, but crucially, how they reflect Coda's personal life, problems, thoughts, feelings, how the games are purposeful expressions of the inner workings of their developer. I see this person who's filled with thoughts and feelings and beliefs and has no way to express them except as scattered and unheard voices in a game that wasn't meant to be played. Davey fails to realize how much of his own baggage he's bringing along for these interpretations and is in deep denial about how much he's hurting this creator he's idolizing. Davey's even been altering Coda's games to improve them and make them seem even more meaningful. By the end of the game, the player is left wondering, was Davey even really Coda's friend? Was he a clingy fan? Or maybe even like a stalker? In retrospect, I think I was probably a bit too pushy trying to get his attention. Uh, I was over-enthusiastic. 
but he was very gracious about it and very patient with me. The facade of Davy's altruistic advocacy for Coda's work crumbles over the course of the Beginner's Guide, and it's eventually laid bare that he is dependent on Coda and has been a manipulative and toxic force in his life. And indeed, Davy hasn't learned anything from Coda's final game, which was specifically made for him as a breakup letter of sorts, because Davy goes and includes this final callout game in the collection anyway. I'm the reason that you stopped making games, aren't I? A collection of games Davy did not make, which he puts up for sale on Steam in the hopes that this will draw Coda out of hiding and they'll make up, be friends again, Coda will want to make games again, and Davy can feed off the psychological high he gets from the secondhand praise that comes with being a pretentious fuck presenting and interpreting that work for others. I, I mean, I, I, I get it. <clears throat> So I started showing Coda's work to people. I took this one, and the island that you just played, the theater, the notes, the house cleaning game, and some of the prison escape games. I brought them to people that I knew and, and trusted. I asked their opinions. And the great part is that they really loved his games. You know, the, the point of it all was just to give him some external reference point, but they, they genuinely loved his work. There was nothing for him to be afraid of. Davy's still stuck in the delusion that he's helping Coda, and selfishly still wants the machine to turn on and make more games. Davy comes so close to doing the right thing, which is letting go of this relationship. But at the last moment, he doesn't. Can you see why I felt like this was the right thing to do? Because it's the thing that I always feel like I need, to be told that my work is good. That I am good. When, when someone really connects with a thing that I've made, when they see themselves purely in my work, there's nothing that feels better. And I got to give that very same feeling to my friend. I did something... I really felt like I'd done something good. Like, like I was a good person. I felt like there was a friend who was in trouble and was unhappy and, and maybe didn't like themselves, and I could fix it. If I could give him this gift, maybe I could fix the problem. When they told me how much they enjoyed his games, it was the best feeling. It was the absolute best feeling. It, it made me feel so happy. So beautifully, beautifully happy. That's why I'm releasing this collection of your work. Is because I haven't been able to find any other way to reach you. I've tried everything. And so a part of me has hope that if I put this compilation out into the world, and if I put my name on it, that maybe enough people will play it so that it'll find its way to you, so that I can tell you that I'm sorry. I know I screwed up. If I apologize to you truly and deeply, will you start making games again? And, well, literally speaking, Davey couldn't have learned his lesson and dropped this relationship because then the beginner's guide wouldn't be on Steam. Davy wouldn't have released it if he had actually overcome his struggle to let go of Coda and find his own worth without it being dependent on someone else. Well, literally probably isn't the right word there, because, again, I must stress, this Davy is not literally the real Davy Reedon. This is like a fictional character. <laughs> Those Coda games weren't made by a single guy named Coda. Reedon directed the level designers to make them to tell the story of the Beginner's Guide. There was actually a handful of people who got bamboozled by this and thought the game was nonfiction. And, um, oops. Like lots of games about feelings, the Beginner's Guide was a little divisive. Even the players who understood that it was fiction cited its pretension and not a real gameness as the reason for their negative reviews. Hell, the Wikipedia page mentions pretentious in the header. <laughs> Woof. <laughs> the Beginner's Guide is too short to explore its central themes to their full potential, so Readin resorts to unloading very heavy-handed, blunt, and kind of pretentious ideas rapid fire. I frequently found that the ideas the developer expressed via his commentary, which is always on, wasn't being shown through the visuals as effectively as he might have thought, and before you ask, yes, I understand the themes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Man, I hate that they interpreted the game itself as pretentious when it's the character of Davy that's pretentious, but... Oh well. Why did I expect media literacy in the comments? In the reviews of Steam? Why would that- why would that be there? And while the OG Stanley Parable also got some heat from the not-a-real-game crowd, the negative reviews definitely focused less on pretension and also wasn't so big on personally attacking the developer. But I imagine a lot of that is also due to the fact that, you know, the narrator of the Beginner's Guide is Davy. Davy Readin playing Davy. Who isn't Davy Readin? Okay. The funny thing about The Beginner's Guide is that it's a game about a parasocial relationship, about a guy trying to analyze and figure out a creator using only the stuff he makes. And after it came out, there was quite a lot of analyzing and speculation about Readin. How fictional was this game? Is it based on a true story? It became less about who is this fake Davy and became more of who is the real Coda? Who is this obviously based on? Can we figure this out through the work? Can we figure out and psychoanalyze Readin through this work? I asked him so many times to please just tell me what his games mean to him. I asked him please to tell me what the three dots mean. And he wouldn't. And that's what we call missing the point. And hell, I might be missing the point, big time. After all, this is my interpretation of a game that's like warning against overinterpreting stuff. Uh, so, haha. <laughs> Can you tell why it took a little while for me to um, make this video? It's a little, <laughs> it's a little tricky. It's a little tricky, little tricky one I got here on my hands. <laughs> But anyway, here we are today with the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, which kind of melds the topics of Stan Para and the Beginner's Guide. On the one hand is the fun ribbing about the illusion of choice, which can be very roughly simplified to what is a game and what is fun, along with the critique of, you know, phoned-in sequels and soulless DLC. This is what happens when greedy video game developers with no respect for their fan base rush a cheap expansion to market for no reason other than to make an easy dollar. And on the other hand, more so in Act 2 than in the other acts of the game, is a more personal feeling commentary about player expectations, the emotions and interpretations we unwittingly pour into someone else's work, and how unhealthy the creator-consumer relationship can be from both sides. Oh no. Oh god no. Stanley, it's a collection of reviews from Steam, the online video game distributor. The narrator is obnoxious and unfunny, with his humor and dialogue proving to be more irritating than entertaining. Unfunny! I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to make a serious work of art. But where are the jokes? Where are the jokes? They bemoaned, they screamed, they gnashed their teeth and said, entertain us. It wasn't enough. They had to leave a pathetic little thumbs down review and make all of their pitiful demands. But then he's talking too much, they said. First, he didn't entertain us. Now he went, shut up. It's the inconsistency. It's the lack of accountability. I'll talk about this a bit more later, but I can't help but notice that both the Beginner's Guide and Stan Para Ultra Deluxe have this kind of emotion in it. Real feeling, rough feelings about games and how players interact with them. They're both told through a fictional narrator having a bit of a mental breakdown, but Stan Para couches it in loads of self-deprecating humor, creating a safe distance so as to not come off as genuinely preachy or uncomfortably vulnerable. And I think this was a lesson learned from the Beginner's Guide, which had this same sort of thing going on, but it was absolutely not played for laughs. And Davey said it best before he has his own mental breakdown in the Beginner's Guide. Personally, I think it's awful to watch this, to see a person basically unraveling through their work. So like, Raiden knew that the Beginner's Guide was going to make people uncomfortable. He's not dumb. Another little semi-similarity I want to point out, because I think it's neat, is that the Beginner's Guide is about a one-sided, unhealthy relationship, Davy relying on Coda for his own sanity, and Stanley Parable keeps coming back to the narrator's sense of sanity, which is very much defined by whatever Stanley is doing. Or not doing. Stanley, please. I, I need you to make a choice. I need you to walk through the door. Are you listening to me? Can you hear me? Is everything all right? Stanley, this is important. It might be the most literally codependent relationship in a game ever. 
The parts of the game where the narrator ditches you or you ditch him are some of the most jarring as nobody can really proceed. I suppose there is one thing I can do to fix this. I'm out. Goodbye, Stanley. You couldn't bear to be away from the hole, and now you'll get more time with it than you could ever have asked for. It's a win for everyone. You get to be with the hole, I get to do literally anything else. Take care, Stanley. I hope you and the hole have a wonderful rest of eternity together. He's not the unreliable narrator, it's more like you're the unreliable player or consumer. Also, both games have themes of putting someone or something on a pedestal, calling something perfect and meaningful and making an auteur out of its creator. I felt pretty hard for this one. I feel like it's one of the most relatable experiences that you can have. To uh, assume that some other person is perfect and totally fulfilled in every way and completely miss all of the little flaws that make them painfully human. I think about this game a lot these days. Autorship is another interesting and troubling trend in gaming that is thankfully getting more skeptical eyes on it lately. If you somehow don't know what that is, the gist is that it's basically assigning the entirety of a game's vision to a single prominent person. In reality, very, very, very few games are made by one guy with one vision. Raiden didn't make the Stanley Parable all by himself either, just look at the credits. But he gets the credit more than anyone else because he's the writer and he gets the praise and the intense expectations that come with auteurship. So overnight, our work became a kind of phenomenon, and the two of us were at the center of it. In fact, primarily I was at the center of it, largely because I had been the sole creator of the original game, and so as a result, many media outlets focused more on me as the face of the operation. It's easy to relate to either Coda or Davy in the Beginner's Guide if you're someone who wants to make something but can be uncomfortable with praise and negativity alike. Raiden did write a post about the success of the original Stanley Parable that was really incredible, but unfortunately, it is deleted now. I'm not going to cover it closely out of respect for the dude's decision to make it inaccessible, but it puts into words, words that were misconstrued as him complaining about being too successful, probably hence why the post is deleted, how horrifying it can be to be a creative person, to be drawn to expressing yourself in that way, to put a lot of yourself into something, and then to just release it to the world. It, it's just out there now, and it's not yours anymore. Anyone can decide what it means now, and anyone can misunderstand it and decide what they think of you, the person who made it. He also mentioned during this lecture that I've been splicing in here that he really had to come to terms with the fact that he had a problem. He really wanted very badly to connect to people and to be liked, but you can't control how people see you especially through your work. And he was making games for the wrong reason. And so I'm thinking, uh, as I'm making Stanley Parable, you know, I'm thinking to myself, when I put this out, you know, people who already know me, sure, they'll see the work and then they'll see me and then they'll really know me. And then they'll get me because I put so much of myself in this game. And then I'll get the full 100%. You know, I'll get to really connect with people. Then they'll really like me. If you're not being mindful about why you're making the things that you're making, what do you stand to lose? I see the beginner's guide as both a literal and a symbolic cautionary tale told from both sides of an unhealthy relationship. I don't think Reedon ever literally knew a guy like Coda and drove him away with his intensely pushy personality. There's the more straightforward parable here of parasocial relationships. I'm sorry, I keep using the word parasocial. I know it's gauche now, but whatever, that's what this is. And boundaries. Davy's ignorance or flagrant trespassing, depends on how culpable you feel the character is, his ignorance of Coda's boundaries versus Coda's sheepishness to enforce his boundaries despite being made deeply uncomfortable. It's a warning to not be that guy. Both guys, either guy, don't be that guy. Don't be Davy, ignoring others' boundaries. And don't be Coda, too nice, too sheepish to enforce your own boundaries. And on the other hand is my other interpretation of the beginner's guide, the one that makes me feel like a creep and a huge hypocrite for suggesting it after all the stuff I said earlier about not reading into people's work too much and assuming you know anything about them. That theory is that this is based on a true story, but not literally. 
This did not literally happen. <laughs> I think that both characters are written, but told in a really exaggerated, extremely self-loathing fashion. The praise-seeking asshole Davy and the withdrawn Coda, who has a difficult time removing Davy's influence from his life. It's the creator's own unhealthy inner workings of how and why he makes stuff. His thirst for acknowledgement versus his struggle to satiate the thirst with his work. Davy is Reedon's addiction to praise. Coda is Reedon's creative abilities, which are marred and poisoned by Davy. I'm fucking up. I'm fucking up right now. This is me fucking up. I'm fucking up. I'm not supposed to be doing this to this game. Of all games, this is not the one you're supposed to do it to. This is the one that's like, don't do it. And here I am. I'm doing it. I'm making a whole fucking video about it. And I'm fucking it up. Validation is not a vaccine. You don't just take it once and then the disease goes away. You have to keep taking it like hunger. It returns every single day. You cannot sate the desire to be praised. In fact, the very opposite. The more you feed it, the stronger it grows. I was going into this launch trying to get something that you actually cannot get to be 100% validated by others. Please, I need to feel okay with myself again. And I always felt okay as long as I had your work to see myself in. I mean, is, is something wrong with me? Even now, the disease is telling me to stop. Don't show people what a shitty person you are. They'll hate you. If we want the rewards of being loved, we have to submit to the mortifying ordeal of being known. Or in the case of the beginner's guide, not known at all, misinterpreted. And hell, am I being stupid as hell and misinterpreting all of this right now? Am I being too parasocial, being empathetic to a person that I've never met but appreciate the work of? Would I scream and have to lay down and do little weird kicks if the narrator ever said my name? Jim. Oh, still close. Just a little. The end has to be S. J Jim. J S. J. Mm. Jim. No, no, it's not Jim. Uh, if only my name was Jim. I also can't help but notice a lot of visual similarities between the Stanley Parable and the Beginner's Guide. The theater stage and the fame environments. The hole in Stanley Parable and the prison well hole in the Beginner's Guide. The sand rising up as Davy comes to the realization that he's a sad, sick, isolated person dependent on praise, versus the desert you emerge into after the long isolation following the narrator reflecting on praise during the skip button sequence. And also this building you emerge from in general, like into this vast desert, they just kind of remind me of a coda level, but that might just be due to both games' similar usages of liminal spaces. And I'm probably a big idiot for all of this. Um, the thing is, these two and a half-ish games are laser focused to be my bullshit. And yet they're both at least partially about how slippery that slope can be. The weird, awkward, should I read into this or not dance that I do with Reedon's work is one of the reasons I find his stuff so compelling and fun. But is that, like, weird of me? Is that wrong of me to do? By giving the narrator some of the anxious introspection that's way more front and center in the beginner's guide is Reedon using comedy to cushion the blow? And it's all because of those reviews. Those reviews that I couldn't get out of my head. I just couldn't ignore the negative feedback. Why was it so important for me to fix the problem? I feel like a failure, I guess, when I can't fix the problem. Why did Cookie Nine's opinion matter so much to me? I've never even met Cookie Nine. I have no idea who they are. What would it ever really matter? But here I am. I'm fixating on every tiny negative thing that anyone ever says about me. It's strange, but the thought of not being driven by external validation is unthinkable. Like, I actually cannot conceive of what that would be like. I can't stop myself from lashing out with a vengeful fury to alter and to change and to break anything unbroken if only it pleases this one person who made a single negative comment. What does such an impulse serve? For whose benefit is this? More, 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 more love, more praise, more people telling me that I'm good. Always more, more, more. It's like a disease. By presenting these anxieties in a self-aware, self-loathing, sarcastic way, does that effectively unpretentious it? Stanley, I'm not preachy, am I? 
Is that like a defense mechanism on the part of the writer to make sure people don't get too mad at the art feelings game? Or is it more of a delivery method? The airplane going into the gamer's mouth to make the nutritious stuff more palatable. You know, humor is like such a universal thing. It's the way that, it's the thing that gets you to like let down your guard, right? You know, when, when, you, when you're laughing at something, that's like your way of saying, oh, things are okay, right? You know, it's safe here. I don't, I don't need to be so, so cautious. And in Stanley Parable's case, that was actually really good because what we would do is, we, we actually kind of figured out this formula that um, sort of like late in development, we realized that we were doing this one very specific thing over and over, which was like, um, send people down this path and then throw a joke at them, right? And then give them some like little humorous thing to interact with, right? And then throw another joke at them and then kind of bring that together in this weird kind of funny set piece, right? And let them hang out in that for a while. And then it would switch and it would get like super dark and super serious and super like existential crisis mode. Uh, but like because of all of that comedy, it really like let people let their guards down and it kind of like welcomed, they were willing to like welcome the game in and be like, oh, okay, you're, you're safe, you're a friend, you know? you we can uh, we can have an actual conversation here oh shit what if i'm kind of right about this so so wait you watching the video right now you're probably thinking that i must have seen this read and lecture before writing the script to this video right you're fucking wrong you're wrong no, get this. I found that video of him talking about this shit last week, and the video was 90% done, like editing and everything. So, um, spooky. Uh, this lecture has only been backing up points that I had already formulated way before seeing the lecture. Whoa. <laughs> Anyway, if the Beginner's Guide was a symbolic retelling of Reedon's unhealthy reaction to the success of the Stanley Parable, I think Ultra Deluxe is almost exactly the same thing, but it's just cushioned by humor and more obvious self-deprecation than what was happening in the Beginner's Guide. I think he learned that the Beginner's Guide was just straight up broccoli. So am I dead ass 100% convinced of all the stuff I just said? No, <laughs> no, hell no, 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 I'm not. Um, I think, I think the internet forgets sometimes that like you can have an opinion without being super militant about it or dying on a hill over it or anything like that. Like, yes, I made a long ass video about this stuff, but it's okay. These are just things I like to think about without coming down on a definitive answer for myself. Besides the answer of, like, this is all fun stuff to think about, but it's even more fun to try to make others think about it too. Is that why I stream? Make video essays? Blurt opinions out on podcasts? Am I looking for external validation in the same way Davey does in the Beginner's Guide? Am I a fraud? Is part of the reason this was written this way, was it to make me ask that of myself? To share the load in this mortifying ordeal? Ooh, puppies! But hey, I think that the one big thought we can take away from Reedan's writing is that you can't expect others to understand you if you don't understand yourself. But not understanding yourself is a scary thing to think about and most people would rather not. They'd rather play a silly video game or something, uh, and you kinda gotta trick them a little bit to eat the existential broccoli. Are Davy and Coda two facets of Reedan's personality? If I said that I knew that for sure, I'd have proven I didn't learn a thing from the Beginner's Guide. All I know is that the guy is a great writer and I can't wait to see whatever funny, weird, biting, clever stuff he gets up to in the future. It's nutritious stuff. Je suis dans la seul sous la pluie de velours Et je n'attends plus que toi mon amour C'est là dans la mémorisone Où je me remémore le jour Où je t'ai rencontré mon amour Mais ici c'est aussi Où je me souviens de la sortie de The Stanley Parable. I 
I'm really pissed off. I lost the tie that came with the Stanley Parable um, collector's edition. I don't know where it went. I looked everywhere.